Hello, in this video we're going to have a look at Perlin Noise, and we're going to generate some Perlin Noise too. At some point in your game programming career, or your graphics programming career, you're going to need to generate something automatically, or procedurally. And the trouble is with a lot of random number functions, is they generate very random looking noise. And the human brain is very good at noticing that the noise doesn't look quite right. And in fact, it looks too random. So to create a more natural looking noise, a scientist by the name of Ken Perlin came up with an algorithm which generates noise that has local coherence. So even though it is still random, it has features that are clustered together. And to our primate brains, this looks quite natural. Here in Photoshop, I've created an array of 256 by 256 pixels of grayscale noise. And we can see it just looks like static from old televisions. Perlin noise is a bit different because it's got features and natural looking features at that. And you can use Perlin noise to create artificial terrains. For example, if I add this colour map to the Perlin noise in the background, we can see we've got an ocean, beaches, greenery going into mountains capped with snow. And that's far more natural looking than using the original noise source, which simply looks like rubbish. Perlin noise can be generated in multiple dimensions. In this case, we've got a 2D Perlin noise map, but this is actually 3D because we're looking at it from above. The intensity of the pixel can be considered height. If we were to take a slice through a particular line of this image, we'd end up with a 1D array of Perlin noise, which would be like looking at the mountains from the side. Before we get stuck into the code, I'd like to run through a simple Perlin noise algorithm by hand, and this is going to generate 1D Perlin noise. There is some philosophical debate whether it's 1D or 2D, because of course, in order to see 1D Perlin noise, you need to witness it in a two-dimensional space. However, I'm going to say that this is one-dimensional Perlin noise because the result is stored in a one-dimensional array. But let's begin. At the bottom, I have a one-dimensional array of noise. So these are values between, for the moment, 0 and 1. And I have 16 elements in the array, and these are just generated by the rand function. And we generate Perlin noise by selecting values from the uh, seed array at specified pitches, which we can also call octaves. And so starting at the beginning, I'm going to say that our Perlin noise is going to be our scaling factor, which is 1.0 in this case, uh, times our sample of x, but the pitch size is going to be, well, that's going to be the size of the array to begin with, which is 16, which rather curiously means we're going to sample at the zero location, and we're also going to sample at the 16th location, but we don't have one, we only go up to 15, so it wraps around. So, oddly, we're going to be sampling from the same location twice, which in this case looks to be about 0 0.7, which let's say is about there, and we linearly interpolate between the two values. But this leaves us only one choice, because both values are 0.7, our linear interpolation is going to be a straight line. This may seem a bit odd, but wrapping around like this enables some quite desirable properties of Perlin noise, which we can explore later on. We've now generated one octave of Perlin noise, so we'll move on to the next. And we're going to halve the scaling factor, and we're going to halve the pitch. So we don't change the contents of our seed array, we just change the maximum value, we've scaled it. And we're now sampling here and here. And again, we wrap around and sample the first location. Now this time, in our noise array, the value is about 0.3. Previously it was 0.7, so we add the two together. But because our pitch has halved, we also now need to include the eighth element here. And we can see that this in our array is quite low but it gets added on to what is already there. And by using our wraparound linear interpolation again, we can see we go back up. So I'll join these now with a straight line. Well, straightish. We've now completed the second octave, so it's time to move on to the third. Well, again, we halve the scaling factor, and we also halve our sampling pitch. So we're going to sample, again, the 0th element, the 4th, the 8th, the 12th, and, well, it wraps around, back to our original value. We can see that the scaling value is getting smaller, so our graph isn't going to grow much larger than the 1.0 originally, although at the end we will accumulate all of these scaling factors and rescale the pearl in noise. But for now we know we've got four additional straight lines to add. For the zeroth element, we've only got a small increase, it's about 0.13. But we've got the full 0.25 
being added to the current green line for our fourth element. So that goes up a little bit. Our eighth element is again quite low. Our twelfth element is also quite high now. And we finally wrap around to our original value. So I'll draw in these straight line segments. And that's our third octave completed. Let's now move on to the fourth octave then. So we halve the scaling factor, so it's 0.125 this time, times s, and our pitch is also halved to be 2. So our seed range is scaled to 0.125, and we're going to be sampling every second element. So 0, here, 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 8, 10, 11, 12, 14, and of course it wraps around. The numbers are getting a bit too small to remain accurate, but I'm going to eyeball it so we can still get a feel for how the algorithm works. So we've got a small increase for our zeroth element. We can see 2 is a bit higher, so that gets added on. We're adding on to the blue line now, of course. The fourth element is high again, so that gets added on. Sixth element is low. And eighth element is low. Tenth is, well, not quite as high as the fourth, so we'll stick it about there. And twelfth is high again. Fourteenth is very low, but it can't go below the blue line because we're adding on to it. And finally, we go back round to our first value. Draw these in. That was a better attempt at straight lines. We've got one last octave to do, and of course, because I've not planned ahead, I can't fit it onto the top of the line, which is a 0 0.0625 times our sample seed, but our pitch is now 1, which is going to be our final octave, because we can't halve the pitch any further. So our seed is scaled to 0 0.0625, and we're sampling every element this time. Which means, of course, we're effectively just adding the seed array onto the yellow line because if the pitch is 1, it doesn't really make much sense to linearly interpolate between two neighbouring values. However, we don't need to have a special case in the algorithm for this, because the maths will just work that out. So let's add the final octave to the current yellow line. A little bit down, a little bit up, a lot down, a lot up. And again, join them all up. The final magenta line now reflects our Perlin noise output but it's quite useful to make sure that the result of our Perlin noise function lies between 0 and 1, so we've got control over it. This is quite simple to do, because all we need to do is divide the Perlin noise output by the sum of all of our scaling factors, which means our output now goes from 0 to 1.0. Because we were wrapping around when we were sampling, we know that this location will be the same height as this location. And that means we can tessellate our Perlin noise, it will move smoothly from one side of the image to the next. And because we've constructed the noise using octaves, all of the features in this output graph are of a comparable size. So if we halve the graph, we can see we've got two main lobes, which have a similar quantity of feature inside them. And we can see quite clearly that if we take any consistent length across our graph, it looks like the features are of a similar scale. And this is great, because we've gone from an originally very noisy source in the seed to a noise pattern which has some local coherence. And it's this local coherence which leads to an organic noise. And when we've got an organic noise, we've got a noise which is more suitable for generating natural looking things, because we perceive the coherence in the output, i.e. it no longer looks random. And through this, Perlin noise is a great noise generator for lots of things in games, such as landscapes, terrains, mountain scenes, uh, procedurally generated textures, maps, rooms, all sorts of things. Let's create some code now to generate 1D Perlin noise. I'm going to start by deriving a class from the OLC console game engine. I've called it Perlin noise demo. And I've created an instance of the class, which is 256 by 256 characters wide and characters high, and each character is going to be a very small 3x3 three three pixels. That's so I can fit it onto my 1080p monitor. As usual, we'll be adding variables to this class and overriding the onUserCreate and onUserUpdate functions. I'm aiming to create an interactive demonstration program so we can play with Perlin noise in both 1D and 2D. But let's start by recreating the 1D demo I've just demonstrated by hand. 
However, this time my array size is dictated by the size of the console we've established, which is 256 wide. So that's how big the ultimate array is going to be. And I'm going to create two arrays. One is F noise seed 1D, which is a floating point array full of just random noise. And this is going to be the output Perlin noise 1D, uh, which will show us our ultimate Perlin noise. So let's start by creating these arrays. I'm going to set an output size to the screen width, which we already know is 256, and I'm allocating the memory for the two floating point arrays. I'm then going to fill the noise seed array with random noise between 0 and 1, just using the C++ RAN command. This is by no means an endorsement of the RAND function in terms of its quality as a pseudo-random number generator, but it's completely sufficient for most gaming applications. Because I feel I'm going to want to reuse Perlin noise in the future, I'm going to add a function that generates one dimension of Perlin noise. And this function takes the size of the array, n count, takes a, the pointer to our seed array, which is full of random noise, the number of octaves I want to apply, because I think it'll be useful to see the octaves grow, and uh, of course a pointer to the output array. In the demonstration by hand, we added together the individual octaves as an array. I'm not going to do that here. For each element of the output, I'm going to generate all of the octaves necessary and sum them into that element value. So I'm going to create a little for loop which will allow us to operate on each individual element of the output array. And I'm going to accumulate the noise as we generate each octave. So I need a second for loop to go through these octaves. We know that for each octave, I need to determine two sample points that I can linearly interpolate between. And the distance between these sample points is called the pitch. And if we ensure that our Perlin noise dimensions is always a power of two, we know that the pitch can always be halved quite easily. So in this case, I'm starting with a pitch value, which starts with the width of our Perlin noise array, in this case 256, and I'm dividing it by two the number of times, depending on which octave we're currently operating on. So for this first octave, it starts at zero, so it doesn't get shifted at all, so the pitch is 256. For the next octave, the 256 gets shifted by one, which divides it by two giving us a pitch of 128. The first sample is of course a multiple of the pitch. Now this may look a little odd that we're dividing by n pitch and multiplying by n pitch, but don't forget that this is in the integer domain, so information gets lost during this division. So let's assume our x is 20 and our pitch is 8. The result here is 2, because 20 divided by 8 in integer space is 2 remainder 4, but we don't have the remainder, so this 2 then gets multiplied by the pitch to give us 16, so that's telling us where our first sample value is. The second sample value is just the first sample value with the pitch added to it, but we include the modulus operator to make it wrap around. And this is what gives us boundary coherence so we can tessellate the ultimate random noise. To perform the linear interpolation, we need to know how far into a particular pitch are we. And this is quite easy to calculate in the floating point domain, because we can take our current location, minus our first sample point, which will give us a result between zero and the pitch. And if we divide that by the pitch, we get a value between zero and one, which tells us how far into the pitch are we. And we'll call this f-blend. Linear interpolation is quite a well-known formula, and so I'm just using it directly. And we take one minus f-blend multiplied by our first sample from our noise array. And we add that to F blend times sample 2 from our noise array. We know that we're going to need to change the scale of this sample, so I'm going to add in a scaling variable. I'm going to start it at 1, and our F noise variable is going to accumulate the noise for location x within our output array, but I'm going to scale it according to the current scale value. Once we've completed this octave, we need to halve the scale value. And once we've summed all of the octaves that we're interested in, we simply write the value to our output array for that location. And the process repeats itself for all of the octaves in all of the locations. However, at this point, we've lost control of what the range of our output could be. I want it to be between 0 and 1. So I'm going to accumulate all of our scale values in F scale accumulate. And for each octave, I'm going to update this scale accumulation with the current scale. And when I write my final noise value to the output array, I'm going to divide it by the scale accumulator, which will ensure that my output noise lies between 0 and 1. And that's it, a completely self-contained noise generator for one-dimensional Perlin noise. Let's now draw this to the screen in the onUserUpdate function. 
I want to be able to visualise the noise changing as we increase the number of octaves. So I'm going to create a variable to store octave count. And in the onUserUpdate function, if the user presses the spacebar, I'm going to increase the octave count. But I'm going to make sure that it gets wrapped around if it gets too high, because if the octave count gets beyond 8, for example, in this case, then we'll be stepping through our noise array at a pitch of less than 1, which is no good. There's a maximum number of octaves you can have, given the size of your Perlin noise array. And if there are zero octaves to implement, we don't see anything at all. I can now call our Perlin noise 1D function. And the first variable is the output size of the array, which we know is going to be 256. I then need a pointer to my noise seed array, which is just values between 0 and 1. I'm now going to include the octave count. And finally, a pointer to the output. Perlin noise 1D. So every frame of update we're regenerating the noise, but because the seed doesn't change and the octave count might not change, the output will always be the same. This isn't very computationally efficient, but it's a nice way to change the parameters of the noise generation in real time, so we can see what they do. Because this is 1D noise, drawing it is quite easily. I'm just going to be drawing a line across the screen. So for every X value across the screen, I'm going to draw a pixel depending on the height of the Perlin noise. I know that my Perlin noise lies between 0 and 1, so I'm going to scale it so it fills up the screen from the halfway point. So we'll see a line going from halfway down the screen to the top. I've included a little minus sign here because 0, 0 in the screen coordinate system is the top left. But I want the lines to look like mountains. So I take my Perlin noise output and multiply it by the screen height divided by 2, so it's going to be half the screen high, and I also offset it by the screen height divided by 2. So it draws from the middle of the screen towards the top. Instead of just drawing a line, I'm going to fill in all of the pixels from the middle of the screen to the Perlin noise value. So it will give us a filled in look. Let's take a look. So I can see a green line. We know that our octave count is set to 1. And if I press the spacebar, we've increased the number of octaves. In this case, it's filled it in. We've got two sampling points. We can see it just looks like a triangle. If I add a third one, this is the third octave now. Fourth. 5th, 6th, and 7th. And we can see we get a nice looking terrain. If I press the spacebar again, we've got our final element of noise. And one more time, it's wrapped back round again to 0. And we'll see it doing exactly the same terrain each time. Let's add another button to regenerate the seed array so we can have different terrains. I'm going to have it so if the user releases the Z key, it just simply refills the seed array with random numbers between 0 and 1 again. Let's have a look. So let's put in all of our octaves, and if I press the Z key, we get different terrains. And we can see that first terrain was rather low, and that's nothing but luck that's generated that. Let's pick an octave which seems to have quite a high offset for, for a low octave, so the low frequency is quite dominant here. And as we scroll through the octaves, we saw it generate a nice terrain. One thing to notice here is the terrains look very smooth. And this is because our scaling factor has divided by 2 each time, meaning that the high frequency noise, i.e. the noise where the pitches are close together, contributes less to the overall shape, i.e. it's dominated by low frequency noise, the earlier octaves. Perhaps it's useful to play with the scaling value and see how we can change the high frequency noise contribution to the overall Perlin noise. I'm going to add another variable to the code, scaling bias, which is 2. And this is the value we're going to use as our divisor each time for the scale. I'll need to modify our Perlin noise function to accommodate this. So I'll stick it in after the octaves. We also want to have an f bias variable. And instead of just dividing by 2, we're going to divide by f bias. We'll allow the user to change the bias by using the Q and A keys, and each time they press one of those it changes by plus or minus 0.2. But to make sure that we don't have a divide by 0 at any point, I also need to constrain this to a minimum. So if it's less than 0.2, it gets fixed to 0.2. Let's take a look. So there's our flat line again, let's throw in some octaves. Very nice. If I press the Q button, we can see that the mountains decrease, everything smooths out, and that makes 
the low frequencies more dominant. If I press A, I'm making the higher frequencies more dominant, and we can see as a more jagged terrain. So this is quite a nice feature to have as a variable control, because we can make particularly jaggy terrains, or we can make nice smooth undulating hills. Let's try a few other different types of noise. So they're all reasonably jaggy, and it's nice here because we can see that there are bespoke features which are of a uniform size, mostly. If we uh, up the high frequency component to its maximum, we can see the noise is no longer really coherent. It looks artificially generated, and doesn't look that useful. Maybe this is useful in generating textures of a fluid dripping over a surface, for example. Perlin noise can be quite easily extended to two dimensions. In fact, we treat it as an array of 1D Perlin noise and interpolate between them. So let's assume, for example, I've got one set of Perlin noise that looks like this, and I have another that looks like this. We choose adjacent values and linearly interpolate between the two to give us the value in between. Of course, we don't just have a 1D array of noise to choose from this time, we need to have a 2D map of noise. So let's modify the code to accommodate 2D Perlin noise. I'm going to add a variable called mode, which allows me to select between what type of noise I wish to view. And we will choose the mode depending on what number is pressed. So if the user presses the 1 key, we enter mode 1, and so forth. Which means we need to wrap up our noise generation and drawing to the screen in an if statement for that particular mode. Generating the noise isn't that different from generating 1D noise, it's just everything is now 2D. So we need equivalent 2D variables for all of our 1D variables. So whereas before we had output size, we've now got output width and output height, which are both 256. And the other variables are the same, except this time I've called them 2D rather than 1D. In the onUserCreate function, I'm going to initialize these variables to give us 2D noise. So I've set the output width and output height to the screen width and screen height, created the two arrays, and filled the noise array, the seed array, with random values between 0 and 1 again. I'm going to move the code that fills the array with random values inside the modes, because for 1D we only want to fill the 1D array, whereas for 2D we're going to want to fill the 2D array. So let's add in the second mode. And you can see here this time when I press the Z key, it's actually filling the 2D array with random values. I'm going to simply copy and paste the 1D noise and turn it into the 2D noise function. But this time we need to change the count to width and height. And of course, don't forget the integer. <clears throat> we now need to modify the contents of this function. Well, now we're going to scroll through both X and Y coordinates. And I'm going to cheat a little bit, and instead of count, I'm going to use the n width. Because of our noise arrays always being powers of 2, and our pitches and sampling periods always wanting to be powers of 2, this is OK. But instead of choosing two sample points, I'm going to choose a sample point in the x and y axis. And these need corresponding sampling points, so we can linearly interpolate between them. So you can see the code doesn't change very much, it just doubles up. Instead of a single blend, we now need a blend in both the x and y axis. And we're going to be picking two samples, because we need to now linearly interpolate between these two samples. You may notice that both of these samples use the blend x parameter. And that's because, as I just drew before, we're effectively taking two slices of 1D Perlin noise, and we're going to use the blend y parameter to linearly interpolate between the two samples. The scaling and the bias can all remain the same, and our output remains the same. But this time, instead of outputting just to the x location, we're outputting in 2D space. So it's y times n width plus x. And we've seen this now, I think, in every single one loan coder video. In the same way we did for the 1D Perlin noise, we just call the 2D Perlin noise function. It'll use the same octave count variable so we can see it grow and develop, and we can change the scaling bias, just as we did before. Drawing to the screen is now a little bit more tricky, because well, we're only working in the console, and I have limited grayscale options, but I'm also filling the whole screen. So I'm going to create two nested for loops, x and y, which will iterate through the whole output. And I'm going to take the code that we created for the webcam at the command line video uh, to display the grayscale output. So it just takes the value of the Perlin noise at the particular x, y location we're interested in, 
and then chooses a combination of background and foreground colours and a particular character to blend them accordingly. So it's a bit of an optical illusion. Then it draws a single pixel to the XY location of the required colours. Let's take a look. So the first thing I need to do is enter mode 2 and we can see we've got a solid screen. That's because we've only drawn one octave. Let's add an octave to it and we can see we're starting to get some features. Add another octave, a third one, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. It's quite interesting we're starting to see some organic yet reasonably symmetrical texture. It's not quite symmetrical, but what we do see is that the right hand edge aligns with the left hand edge and the top aligns with the bottom. If I change our scaling bias we might be able to see this feature more dominantly as we introduce higher frequency components to the Perlin noise. So that's the maximum scaling bias we can get. And this starts to look like noise again, which you would expect because our original noise array was just randomly chosen noise. So if we back that off a little bit and choose a fewer number of octaves, we can see we get quite organic looking shapes. And now changing the scaling bias introduces features. And it's these features which we can then further process to generate interesting things. As we saw in the Photoshop example earlier, a simple colour map can start to spark the imagination with what we can do with the noise. So I'm adding a third mode, which in much the same way chooses grayscale, chooses different colours. And I'm also going to make it so the user can press the 3 key. Now let's take a look. So I'll enter mode 3, and we'll add a few octaves worth of information, and we'll increase the scaling bias, let's get it the right way. And we can start to see we've got perhaps islands with water in, and mountains that are snow topped. You've got to use your imagination a little bit. Let's try a different set of seeds. And we'll start with a lower number of octaves again, and now we're starting to generate maybe reasonably natural looking terrains. And so once you fine tune the algorithm to use the right number of octaves and the right type of scaling bias, we can generate terrains perhaps for commanding units across. Interesting obstacles for pathfinding algorithms. Typically the point of Perlin noise is in its raw state like this it isn't very useful, but now we can use this to add more features we can post-process the Perlin noise in creative ways to make decisions for us. And this has just been a very brief introduction to Perlin noise and how to generate it. As always, the code is available on GitHub. If you've enjoyed this video, please give me a big thumbs up, have a think about subscribing, and I'll see you next time. Take care.